Happy holidays, everybody. Well, folks, I think I found it. The worst Christmas movie ever made. And that is not something I say lightly. I have seen many, many bad Christmas movies. I have reviewed many bad Christmas movies. But this is worse. Worse than Deck the Halls, or Christmas with the Cranks, or Eight Crazy Nights, or the Star Wars Holiday Special. Yes, I said it. It's worse than the Star Wars Holiday Special. It might even be worse than Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas, although it is kind of in the same vein. Ladies and gentlemen, Last Ounce of Courage. Released to theaters in 2012, despite its direct-to-DVD appearance, Last Ounce of Courage is another Christian film, and those always turn out so well. Unlike most faith-based films, which generally rely on word of mouth, this one actually had a fair amount of commercial advertising. It did not pay off, as it only made about one and a half million dollars in its opening weekend, which is pretty weak for a wide release, and was dropped from most theaters after just two weeks. Its total box office revenue was around 3.3 million dollars. I have no idea how that relates to the production budget, as I haven't been able to find those numbers, but given that they actually put some amount of time and money into advertising this film, I would imagine that would at least be a disappointment, if not an outright loss. Of course, it might have done a bit better had they released it during the Christmas season instead of in September. I'm not sure what the logic was there. Did they actually think it would have enough staying power to last three months and would still be running in December? If that is the case, at least they didn't lack confidence. Last Ounce of Courage takes place in the fictional town of Mount Columbus. Is that anywhere near Mount Cleveland or Mount Cincinnati? And our main character is Town Mayor Bob Revere, played by Marshall Teague. I hesitate to call him the hero of this story because he's too stupid to be a hero, but the movie certainly thinks he is. And call me crazy, but I have this hunch that he just might be a fan of America. You know, I always saw myself as a patriot. Have you now? Well, that is interesting because I couldn't help but notice you draped a flag over your motorcycle there. And according to the U.S. Code, Title 4, Chapter 1, Section 7B, the flag should not be draped over the hood, top, sides, or back of a vehicle. But I'm sure you already knew that, being a patriot and all. Bob's story begins with a flashback to the time when his 20-year-old son, Thomas, was deployed by the army to somewhere, they don't specify. And at the young age of 20, he's already married, his wife is pregnant, and she gives him a cross necklace before he goes. They are really laying it on thick, aren't they? Now, on the one hand, you might think a movie that appears to be about Christianity and patriotism would not senselessly kill off an American soldier. On the other hand, I've seen enough of these movies to know that's exactly what they would do. For reasons that are beyond me, these types of Christian filmmakers seem to have a fondness for God killing someone off in order to teach someone else a lesson. Whatever happened to the idea of a just and loving God? Was that so bad? Can we bring that back? God's been watching over me. Only because he's been waiting for just the right moment to push the smite button. And Thomas is killed in combat, leaving his wife a widow and his son to grow up without a father. Merry Christmas! Then we fast forward 14 years and Bob's grandson is now a teenager and hold up. <laughs> something's not right here. This movie was released in 2012. 14 years prior to that would have been 1998. We weren't putting troops on the ground during the Clinton administration. We were just doing bombing runs and firing cruise missiles. In fact, according to official U.S. military records, the number of active duty personnel killed by hostile action in 1998 was zero. Zero. I know Thomas isn't a real person, but even fictional characters need plausible stories. Anyway, the family is apparently coming together for Thanksgiving for the first time since Thomas's death. Not some L.A. gang handshake, is it? Bob, how many L.A. gangsters do you know with Justin Bieber haircuts? Oh, by the way, the grandson's name? Christian. Subtle, huh? And now we know where Kirk Cameron stole that idea. And as they sit down to dinner, Grandma tells everyone they bought an old church and turned it into a community mission. And the church used to have a cross hanging outside, but they took it down. Can you imagine? It offended somebody. And there it is. 
This is basically what Last Ounce of Courage is all about. White people with a persecution complex complaining about some so-called war on Christianity. And right out the gate, they introduce an example that is complete nonsense. No one is going to make a church take down a cross. It's a fucking church. Where the hell is this coming from? This bullshit continues as they watch some old home movies of Thomas and long for the good old days when people actually celebrated Christmas with decorations and carols and trees and whatnot. Ah, yes, I remember it like it was yesterday. Because it was! But Christian appears to think otherwise because he's a moron. So why don't people do Christmas like that anymore? They do. For a long time, people have been trying to pass laws to get rid of Christmas altogether. Literally, no such laws exist. Today, Christmas is all about Santa Claus and buying things. No, no, no. See, that's okay. Kirk Cameron said so. And the movie goes on and on like this for over an hour and a half. An hour and a half. Now, some of their complaints, while stupid, are at least based on real things, like the fact that most retail outlets say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas, and schools have renamed Christmas Break to Winter Break. Gee, it's almost like they want to be respectful to people of all traditions and faiths. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. That ring a bell? But they also complain about how people don't put up Christmas decorations anymore because apparently it's verboten. You can't put a nativity seed on your front lawn, and you can't put up a Christmas tree in front of City Hall. None of this is actually true, of course. You can put whatever the hell you want on your own lawn, and most government offices still decorate for the holidays. But hey, why let the truth get in the way of a dumb story? Aside from this choir-preaching nonsense, there are a couple of subplots going on. We have what appears to be a blossoming romance between Tommy's widow, Kari, and the local police chief, Greg, who was Tommy's best friend. That's a little weird. It's also the most overly chaste romance I have ever seen. They don't even kiss. They come close once, but that's it. I mean, it's a religious movie, so I don't expect them to get naked or anything, but I do expect... something. Anything. I don't even know why this is part of the movie. It serves no purpose, and it is fantastically boring. And then there's the local junior high school's winter play, which is hilariously stupid. These are the lyrics for the opening musical number. That's it. That just repeats over and over while the one girl dances. Oh. Oh. Oh my god, what are you doing? It gets better. The play is basically the story of Jesus' birth, but reimagined as a science fiction story. And the magi are like aliens or something. The supernova will light our way to the pot of gold. We will find the king just as predicted in the scrolls of Plutonia. I do find it funny that the filmmaker's idea of a secular winter play is still the story of Jesus. They are so one-track minded, they literally cannot think of anything else. Would it have been out of the question to have the kids do a play based on a Christmas carol? Everyone knows the story, it's largely secular, and it's in the public domain, so it wouldn't have cost you anything. Now, when you ultimately trash the play for not mentioning Jesus or some such bullshit, you would have been branded as assholes, but I think that ship has sailed at this point, so you might as well just go for it. Anyway, Bob eventually decides he will no longer stand for his town's distinct lack of festivity. They're gonna deck those halls and trim that tree and put the Christ back in Christmas, goddammit. And everyone is absolutely in shock that Bob wants to <gasps> decorate for Christmas. No one does that anymore. Except for, you know, the vast majority of people in this country. But Bob's actions draw the ire of The Hammer, Warren Hammerschmidt, played by pro football player turned actor, The Hammer, Fred Williamson. And everyone, apart from Bob, is deathly afraid of this guy. And I'm at a loss as to why. The movie just assumes we all know who he's supposed to be, but never even tries to explain what real-world person or organization he's supposed to be an analog for, or why anyone would consider him a threat. Literally all we know is he hates Christmas because reasons. My only guess is that he's supposed to represent the ACLU. And it took me a while to come up with that, largely because if that is indeed what he's supposed to be, the movie does not understand what the ACLU is. Case in point, this argument between the hammer and the bob. You are breaking the law. Show me the law. Well, then you are violating the Constitution. Okay, full stop. The ACLU is made up of lawyers. Lawyers know the law. 
It's kind of their job. And a lawyer is not going to tell you that you are in violation of the law without being able to point to the exact law you are violating. This argument where some small town jack off somehow gets one over a high powered civil rights lawyer is nothing more than an evangelical's wet dream. It would never happen in the real world. In fact, I'm starting to wonder if this movie is supposed to take place in like an alternate timeline or parallel universe or something because, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know if you have eyes, lots of people still put up Christmas decorations. And if you need proof for some reason, take a look at this. This is Christmas in the Park in Plaza de Cesar Chavez in downtown San Jose, California, located at the southern end of the hippie liberal bubble known as the San Francisco Bay Area. And this city is all lit up for the holidays. They have lights aplenty, all manner of cute displays, more Christmas trees than I care to count, and yes, even a nativity scene. You know, that thing this movie claims you're not allowed to put up anymore? They have one on public property within spitting distance of City Hall. You know what they don't have? Protesters and overly aggressive lawyers trying to shut it down because no one fucking cares. And if no one is trying to outlaw Christmas in the Bay Area, home of the Libyous liberals who ever lived, where would they be trying to outlaw it, I wonder? Well, the only example I have been able to come up with was an incident that occurred in the town of Johnsonville, Arizona, back in the winter of 2005. Now, that year, the townsfolk built a large wooden nativity scene just outside the city courthouse, much as they had done every year for the past 30 years. But this year, an attorney who had recently moved to the area, one James Franklin Esquire, filed a complaint with the city upon discovering this nativity scene, as he claimed a large wooden structure in the hot, dry, desert town he lived in would pose a safety and fire hazard. And when the city refused to remove the structure, he sued them. And won. Now, it should be noted that Mr. Franklin was an avowed atheist and was not at all shy about expressing his rather negative views of religion in public, and many of the townsfolk thought his safety hazard excuse was merely a cover for his personal bias. And it should also be noted the structure was inspected by the local fire chief and even an expert they brought in from out of town who both concluded that the risk of fire posed by the structure was minimal at best. But the important thing to remember about this particular scenario is the town of Johnsonville, Arizona doesn't exist. I just pulled that story out of my ass right now. There is no real world example because the war on Christmas is not real. You idiots. Speaking of shit that bears no resemblance to reality, the kids are having doubts about the authenticity of their winter play. I've been doing some serious research and the real Christmas story Shepherds find the baby king, not aliens. No, you don't say. Really? Weird. What? You can't be serious. Well, I didn't know. I never read the Bible. Good King Wenceslas. I thought Blondie number one was being sarcastic. You're seriously telling me that these white kids living in small town USA don't know that the story of Jesus doesn't involve aliens? Come the fuck on. I am not buying this for one second. You know why? Because the movie flat out tells me I shouldn't. Bob's entire justification for putting up all these Christmas decorations is over 80% of the country celebrates Christmas, although it was actually slightly less than 80% in 2012, but not the problem, and Christmas was declared a national holiday 150 years ago, although it was closer to 140, but again, not the problem. The point is, the movie points out more than once that Christmas is a holiday recognized by the federal government and the vast majority of its citizens, which is true, but at the same time, nobody celebrates Christmas anymore or puts up decorations, and people think the story of Jesus involves aliens. And the movie never even attempts to reconcile this obvious contradiction. Now you might be wondering what exactly prompted this change of heart. Why are Bob's family and friends and the kids at Mount Columbus Junior High suddenly getting back in the Christmas spirit? Well, it has to do with Christian's late father. What did my dad die for, Bob? Considering he somehow died in combat in 1998, I have no freaking idea. But seriously, 
This is their justification for their actions. They are fighting back in the war on Christmas to honor the men and women who have given their lives for this country. Fuck all the way off. It's one thing to bitch and moan about the non-existent war on Christmas. It's stupid, but all you're doing is making yourselves look like fools, and that's your problem. But once you start invoking the people who have paid the ultimate price in the service of the United States of America just to prop up your stupid fucking persecution complex, that is where I draw the line. You do a great disservice to all of the men and women who have served this country by using their good names for such a worthless cause. And for that, you should all hang your heads in shame. Shame. And if that wasn't enough, the movie actually tries to claim Bob isn't just fighting for Christianity. He's fighting for religious freedom in general, which is a fucking joke. If you're a Muslim, you want to pray to Allah in the middle of the town square. By all means, please. It's one of your rights. You know damn well that if the target audience for this movie saw a Muslim praying to Allah in the middle of the town square, they would immediately assume he was a terrorist, you disingenuous shit biscuit. Have a seat. Well, you're already sitting, but you know what I mean. Anyway, here's a plot twist that I admit I did not see coming, because it's stupid and pointless. The hammer eventually gets his way when he exposes Bob's dark and secret past, which Bob has to tearfully explain to his wife. Bob was also a military man and apparently earned the Medal of Honor for his service. But during his time in Vietnam, he led a POW rescue mission that went horribly wrong when he didn't spot a tripwire in time and they all died. Okay, if that's true, what was the Medal of Honor for? They generally don't give those out for incompetence. The weird thing is, the school janitor, who was apparently in Bob's unit, small world, claims the horrible rumors about Bob aren't true. But Bob confirms he did, albeit inadvertently, lead those POWs to their deaths. So, what part of the story isn't true? I'm completely confused. In any case, the hammer gets to tear down the town Christmas tree, and he stomps on the angel ornament so you know he's evil. And Bob is fired by the city council- wait, what? Since when can the mayor be fired? Mayor is usually an elected position, and the mayor is usually the one in charge of hirings and firings in the city. Now, mayors can be impeached, of course, or recalled, but not fired. But hey, this movie has not borne any resemblance to reality up until this point. Why start now? And Bob decides the best way to counter this revelation about his past is to... rehang the cross outside the community mission by himself, with nothing but a rope. Yeah, that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do and not at all a safety hazard. Whoa, slow down, boys. There you go. Remember, that cross is supposed to be heavy. You gotta struggle a bit. And then Bob gives an allegedly inspirational speech. 400 years ago, our forefathers left the religious oppression of another land to build this one. Wait, now we're talking about the pilgrims? Is this a Christmas movie or a Thanksgiving movie? The first thing they did was to put a cross on the shores of the Atlantic. I have no earthly idea what Bob is even talking about here. I have done far more research for this movie than I should have to, and I cannot find one reference to the Pilgrims planting a cross on the Atlantic shore. Which makes sense considering the Pilgrims were Calvinists and they were not very big on cross worship. That's partly why they left the Church of England in the first place. You're just talking out your ass now, Bob. And Bob is rightly arrested for his shenanigans and thrown in jail. I know the truth. Well, could you please enlighten the rest of us? Because I still don't understand how getting a bunch of POWs killed earns you a freaking Medal of Honor. But a mysterious stranger in the cell next to him provides a radio so he can listen to the school's winter play. Do they normally broadcast those on the radio? And this is where the movie hits a new low. The kids hijack the play and proceed to tell the actual biblical story of Jesus' birth, and Christian follows it up with a video filmed by his father, which shows the very moment he's killed. I would ask how his father got blown up while that camera had nary a scratch on it, but that doesn't really matter. You just showed a snuff film in the middle of a junior high school play. Everyone in that auditorium, with no warning at all, just had to watch someone die. 
Merry Christmas! And the amazing thing is, no one in the audience objects to any of this. In fact, they get a standing ovation. Horseshit. If that happened at any school I attended, and mind you, I grew up in a red state, heads would roll. That little shit's Christmas present would have been expulsion, and rightfully so. And for the cherry on top of this shit Sunday, Bob is released from prison because nothing matters anymore, and it turns out the play was not, in fact, broadcast on the radio. It was a Christmas miracle. Jesus wept. Freedom only comes with great sacrifice. What sacrifice? You spent an hour in jail and you and your family made collective asses of yourselves. The only thing you sacrificed was your dignity. And the movie ends with a really terrible patriotic song and... Oh god, they're showing an image of a wounded veteran? Haven't you done enough? Well, at least they're not going so far as to show a veteran who was actually killed in combat. Oh, for the love of god! You know what? Every single person who worked on this movie, every writer, actor, director, producer, every has-been celebrity that promoted this film, I'm looking at you, Bill O'Reilly and Chuck Norris, to each and every one of you, I say, Happy Holidays. Because I know that will burn more than any insult I can possibly come up with. Last ounce of courage? More like last ounce of bullshit. This story is nothing but choir preaching and has no basis in reality whatsoever. It's rather fitting that the movie features a junior high school play, as the acting often resembles the quality of a junior high school play, and it looks like it was filmed for about $10,000 over a weekend. And if that's all it was, I wouldn't have been anywhere near as angry with this movie as I am now. Movies like that are a dime a dozen. I'm used to them. But they had to go and use dead servicemen to prop up their ridiculous claim that Christians are somehow an oppressed majority. How fucking dare they? One more time. Shame. If the second coming ever happens, I hope Jesus gives these motherfuckers the money changer treatment. But until that day comes, I'll have to settle for giving this movie the Brian Alvarez treatment. Minus five stars. Well, next time we'll get back to the worst picture winners. Until then, I wish you all a happy and healthy holiday season, and Hollywood can... You know what? It's Christmas. They can have a break. Torch to Nada Isabella. <laughs> <laughs>